we will be discussing direct guidance and avoiding punishment within our classrooms. What is direct guidance? Direct guidance includes techniques that build on a positive classroom environment by focusing on the individual child, setting realistic expectations, and recognizing appropriate behaviors. Punishment is used to discipline the child for making a wrong choice and is detrimental to building self-esteem. So obviously we can see that one of these is much more positive than the other. So this presentation will kind of go in more depth about why as educators, we need to focus our energy on direct guidance and stay away from forms of punishment. The benefits of positive direct guidance for a child is that it helps them develop self-control. It also encourages the child to assume responsibility. It helps them in assisting the child in making thoughtful decisions and helps the child fix and develop appropriate behavioral patterns. It's fun to work with kids, except when it's not. While occasional disruptive behavior can happen, it should be rare. One response to misbehavior is the classic timeout. Unfortunately, as tempting as putting a child in timeout may be, it's been shown to have lasting negative effects on future behavior. In other words, timeouts and isolation don't work in the long run. So instead, let's look at two much better options, prevention and proper response. Prevention starts by forming positive relationships with the children in your care. Positive relationships help prevent challenging behaviors from starting. Children pattern their own actions after observing the adults in their lives. You can also help children learn self-regulation, independence, and cooperation by how you approach requests. Always consider the child's interests and include choices whenever possible. This builds respect, invites cooperation, and satisfies a child's need for power and control. For example, when it's time to clean up, give children ownership by asking whether they'd like to pick up the toys first or put books away first. Even with best prevention practices, a child will occasionally lose control and yell, throw a toy, or both. If this happens, your first priority should be to make sure everyone is safe. Then stay calm and stay close. Consider how you would want to be talked to if you had done something wrong. Don't say, I'm disappointed in you. Empathize with the feeling. When the child is ready, quietly say, let's go back and play now. When you focus on preventing misbehavior and use calming strategies to diffuse disruptive behavior, you'll have a more productive, creative, and harmonious class and happier, healthier kids, not to mention a happier, calmer you. Child Care Resources has more helpful suggestions, techniques, and courses to help you learn and practice these and other positive guidance techniques. Visit childcareresources.org or call us to learn more. There are four main ways to include positive guidance in your teaching. The first way is to give choices. Children are so often told that they have to do this or cannot do that. Oftentimes, giving a child a choice between two options, such as either cleaning up markers first or pencils first, allows a child to feel more in control and independent, lessening the chance of the child getting upset. The second way to include positive guidance is to be an active listener. Active listening supports verbal and nonverbal messages and builds two-way communication. Encourage the person to keep communicating. If children can express what they are feeling, adults have clues to guide their behavior. The next way to use positive guidance in the classroom is using humor. Most children respond to adults' joy. When the people around you are happy, you tend to be too. Using humor to laugh at a situation with a child can help lessen tension, but it's important to keep clear of laughing at a child. The final way of using positive guidance is to redirect. When problems arise in the classroom, it might be beneficial to draw the child's attention away from this issue and direct it elsewhere. If a situation doesn't require direct attention, simply directing attention away from the situation is oftentimes the best step. Here are the negatives of punishment. Punishment is used to discipline the child for making a wrong choice 
and is detrimental to building self-esteem. It fosters resentment and retaliation. It can create feelings of isolations and the students can become labeled as the bad kid. Punishment is often a result in the child's humiliation and it is a quick fix, meaning it might stop the behavior for a moment, but there is no learning from it, so the behavior will continue. Eight plus three equals Austin. What were you doing just then? You know that that's not acceptable behavior to throw and to be disruptive. You can either put the paper down and write like Brianna and your other classmates are doing, or you can go to the timeout chair. Oh, uh, what the class is doing. Okay, eight plus three. What, what did Austin say, Brianna? He said nine. He said nine. Is that correct, Christian? No. no, what's the correct answer? Eleven. Nice try, though. Eleven. Okay, let's try another one. Five plus two. Okay, Austin, you made your decision. You're going to have to go to the timeout. <laughs> One plus eight equals timeout. What do you do when timeout doesn't even work in the classroom? Why is the child behaving the way that they are? Now that we understand the ways in which to address the student's behavior in the classroom, it's equally as important to understand why the student is behaving the way that they are. Consider some of the following questions. Is the student tired or hungry or not feeling well? What is upsetting the child and causing this behavior? Are they unable to verbally express their feelings and that's why they are lashing out? Do they seem full of energy and need to find a quiet place to calm down and settle themselves for a few minutes? Does the child want to have control of the situation? Maybe the child doesn't recognize or understand their behavior is being inappropriate. Once you are able to identify the root cause of this behavior, it is easier to guide them through it. Now that we understand the difference between direct guidance and punishment, our group wanted to kind of show a couple different real world examples that might be used in our classrooms. When I become a teacher, I want to practice direct guidance and not punishment in my classroom. For example, if I had a student who was constantly moving around and causing commotion during group circle time, I would take my time to figure out a way for that child to calm down for a few minutes prior to group. I would have a student go to the relaxation area and read or listen to some calming music before they join the group to hopefully relax their body so they wouldn't be as hyper. I feel like a lot of times whenever you have an activity where it's more than just one or two students, if a child begins to act out or move around a lot, you're more likely to result in punishment like a timeout or a separation from the group. When now that we've understand direct guidance and understand that there are reasons behind the child behaving the way they are. Um, you can kind of figure out a way to nip the behavior in the bud and stop it from happening. So in this example, if it's if a teacher understands that the child has a lot of energy or is probably going to be moving around a lot during group, they're able to have that student go to the relaxation area before group starts so that the behavior is less likely to occur and they're more likely to get through group without any major issues. When I have my own classroom, I want to participate direct guidance so that my students feel welcomed and have a positive classroom environment. An important direct guidance technique I will use in my classroom is active listening. Getting down to the child's level and listening to their feelings is one way to guide the students in a positive way and to show them that you are there for them. When I become a teacher, I want to have positive guidance hold a significant role in my classroom. I would like to include children's choice whenever possible. For example, allowing students to help design the order of events that day, such as whether we do math or reading first, is a great way to keep children invested in what we learn as they feel a part of creating it. Students will be more likely to want to participate rather than act out if they feel as if they held a role in deciding what to do. Giving choices would create more independence and control for the children.